Coming up on today's Locked On Senators. Following their third straight loss, the Sens are back on the practice ice, but one key top four defenseman is missing. While Belleville is on a six-game winning streak, so we'll take a look at some of the players contributing to that success. Back-to-back wins here in Winnipeg this weekend. I was boots on the ground, so I'll bring you what I saw. And not only are we going to focus on the prospects in Belleville, but around the hockey world, we're reaching the midway mark of the season. Who's rising and who's falling? That's all coming up on today's edition of the Locked On Senators podcast. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. I'm Jake Sanderson, and you're listening to Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Tim Stützle, and you're listening to the Locked On Senators Podcast. Welcome inside episode 954 of the Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains, today's episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDON for $20 off your first ticket purchase. You can also follow the show on social media. We're at Send Central on Twitter, LockedOn.Senators on Instagram. The show is free and available on all podcast platforms, including on YouTube where a like, comment, and subscription go a long way to helping the show grow. Make sure to hit the notification bell so you know when shows go live and the postcast, which we do after each and every Ottawa Senators game. Today is Monday, January 8th, and Pillsy, we're done with the 10 p.m. starts for now. Yeah, for now, as uh, we get a little time zone relief going to Calgary. But unfortunately, Ross, we are not done with your Ottawa Senators road woes and the road games continue like we mentioned in calgary and then a little closer to home same time zone but then finishing off in buffalo and the road has not been kind to the ottawa senators especially when you take the games played in ontario in toronto out of that streak as well this team just cannot seem to get it done when they're away from home they just can't they're two and ten outside of ontario for road games so far this season, four and 10 on the road overall. It has just been a struggle with them, but it's different ways, right? They're losing. They either give up five goals in the first period or they're winning in the third period, like in Arizona and in Dallas, and they just can't find ways to close out games. So there's not one thing in terms of the back and forth within a game, but there are two things that have really cost them recently, and that's their power play and their penalty killing. There was that stretch where we were blaming the goalies, which really hurts my heart as a goalie-friendly show. To do. I know yours as well, but there was a time where they just couldn't buy a save. But over the last few games, and now this power play, basically since the new coaching staff took over, they score on their very first power play, and since then they're 2 for 25. The PK, 32nd, dead last in the league. You're, you're just not going to be a de- you're not even going to be an okay team if your special teams lets you down night in and night out. Yeah, it, it's been a struggle. And Ross, the worst part about the power play is not only are they not putting the puck in the back of the net with the man advantage, but it seems like more often than not, the better opportunities on their power play come from the opponent's penalty killing unit. It seems like I can remember like four or five breakaways from the last couple games of the other team when they're down a man or their guy coming out of the box to get a good opportunity while the Senators can't muster up anything when they have another guy on the ice. So that's what is really, it's a little extra bit on top that makes this, uh, it adds insult to injury, Ross. It really does. And we discussed this at length in the postcast Saturday night. I posted the video clip of just us talking about the power play and maybe some personnel changes that could be welcome. So you can go check out that video on our YouTube channel. What about the penalty kill though, Pilsy? Because I'd argue that that's been worse than the power play because at least the power play They've only given up a couple of shorthanded goals, right? But I mean, no, in all seriousness, like the penalty kill is dead last. Like there's nobody in the league worse than them. And Minnesota, didn't Minnesota give up five power play goals in one game? Like that should keep you last for a long time. But even they've climbed out of that. And it's your Ottawa Senators who are dead last. Is this a matter of personnel? Is this a matter of positioning, coaching? Or what do you blame it on? Goaltending, I guess, would be the, the fourth option there. 
Yeah, I, I'm not about to blame it on the goaltending after we just talked about how we feel terrible about talking about talking ill about our tendies. So I'm not going to do that. I don't, I don't know if there's one obvious factor here, Ross. I mentioned a little while ago that maybe we need to start seeing some of the more offensive minded players like your Tim Stutzlas, your Josh Norris, your Claude Giroux, like these guys. I'm not saying take them off the penalty killing unit, but maybe don't rely on them as much as they had been relying on them in the past. I don't know. Maybe those guys are are worn down after playing top six, five on five, and then the power play as well. But I don't have a good answer for you, Ross. And unfortunately, neither does Jack Capuano. Well, Jack Apuano not on the ice for practice. Sounds like a flu bug might be going through the team. Just what they needed, right, guys? Going down right. sick. But uh, no, it, right now, it's, it's, for me, it's it's just a matter of getting back to basics. And um, not that it's it's what you want to rely on all the time, but I'm looking at a guy like Parker Kelly as like a leader on the PK right now. And um, on the other side of it, kind of his running mate, his Batman and Robin, what we thought over the last three years, going back to them playing together in the minors, Marcus Stelic might be playing his worst hockey of his career. And man, pressure's on because I know Rourke Chartier is out. He just missed his 10th game with a concussion. He's been placed on long-term injured reserve, or that might be the the last kind of straw they, they need to move here as things are, are developing and we're getting ever so close. Shane Pinto expected to rejoin the team for practice later this week. And a uh, side note before I get back to, to Kostelik, uh Shane Pinto, due to his kind of gray area, RFA status where he can sign after December 1st and all the rules don't apply about him not being able to play. He's actually able to practice with the Sens without a contract. And he obviously needs one to play, but that's something to keep in mind. They don't need a contract space and it makes a really good situation for Steve Steos under the conditions. Good situation, I say, uh, with quotations. But um, the fact that they won't have to make a cap move just to get Pinto up and running with the team getting into the systems, getting into this and that. So at least that can be pushed a little bit. But the one move that was already made, Crookshanks make Cal go down and Matthew Joseph, we expect to come in. We should get the lines here in just a minute. But with Casty, like I think he might be the guy who goes down when they need to make a corresponding move for Shane Pinto because I don't know. It's just not clicking. He He should be big, mean, physical, and he hasn't really been any of those three things. Yeah, and even his uh, play in the faceoff dot, that one thing that kind of kept him above some other teammates, especially fourth-line centermen, has also gone down. Uh, Ross, to kind of go back to the penalty-killing problem and trying to find an answer, well, I was looking at the Ottawa Senators' uh, leaders in shorthanded ice time. Matthew Joseph, fifth among them. So him coming back... Hopefully that's a a bit of a boost to this penalty killing unit because his speed is a real threat on the penalty killing unit. And maybe that has other opponents power plays a little less hesitant to make risky passes. If they know if Joseph picks it off, he's gone and he's got a good chance at a breakaway to create a scoring opportunity. So hopefully Ross, that's an answer that at the very least gets the Ottawa Senators out of dead last in penalty killing percentage. And with Joseph having missed 10 games, he's actually averaging the second most per game just after Parker Kelly. So Mm, once Rourke Chartier comes out, who's third among forwards, look out. Maybe they'll get back to top 10 in PK, I say, with a laugh and a smile. If you, citizens out there, have any ideas how the Senators can be a better special teams unit on power play, on penalty kill, please comment on YouTube. We really want to see that because, man, it cannot continue on like it is right now you look around the league there are just there's some teams who are just getting better they're tightening up they're they're playing you know they're better hockey into the new year as they ramp up trying to be at their best once the playoffs come around where it feels like the senators as well as the other teams who we thought were going to take a step even though detroit's won three in a row they've kind of fallen off buffalo had fallen off earlier it's like it's like these teams who have just done it before they know what it takes and it sounds like steve steos wants to make a move to acquire a guy who's been there, done that. So I'll ask Pilsy about that after the break. We'll also get in to the Belleville Senators because they're shutting it down defensively. They only allowed two goals th- this weekend in Manitoba, one goal against in each game. Matt Sogard didn't have a whole lot of work, but he made some big saves on Saturday. And then Mando was brilliant on Sunday as well. So it's a, a problem that 
hasn't trickled through the entire organization recently. So we'll have some fun talking about the prospects that are producing down there. And then after the World Juniors, Hamara has a great tournament. Pedersen doesn't play a whole lot. We'll discuss all that coming up next. You're listening to Locked On Senators, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. Game Time is the official ticketing app of the Locked On Podcast Network. And I love it because it takes all the stress away from having a good night out. I don't want to be stressed. I'm the worst planner ever. And Game Time makes it easy because you don't have to plan. You can get tickets right up to the day of the event. You can get views of your seats. You get the best price guarantee and Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets all it takes is two taps boom tickets on your phone nice and easy and like i mentioned you get to see the view from your seat before you buy so no worries about obstructions or if you're like ross and you need to see the logo facing a certain way because that just works for you don't worry about it you can make sure you got it all checked out with game time so download the game time app create an account and use code locked on for 20 bucks off your first purchase Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem code locked on for 20 bucks off. L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Today's episode is also brought to you by Farm to Fork. Farm to Fork Delivery.ca. It's a local meat and seafood premium meat and seafood company that's delivering to all of Ontario. Quebec, and up to our friends in Nunavut as well. You can always be sure that you're getting very ethically raised food. You're getting it delicious. And I mean, just look at their five-star average reviews on Google. These are all natural products. They're ethically raised and they're flash frozen right after being hand cut at the butcher's table. So it seals in as much fresh freshness as possible. So much fresher than the meats you're getting at the grocery store. Do you know how long it's been sitting there? I won't break the bank on that one. I'll break it at farm to fork delivery .ca, where you can see all of their products that are individually vacuum packed so that you only have to take out what you need free convenient delivery. You don't have to worry about gas. You don't have to worry about getting even your shoes on. You can stay at home waiting and you'll receive notifications as soon as your order is coming near your home. They've got ribeyes. I'm all over that. Even like it's either barbecue season or it's comfort food season for me. And right now we're in the latter. So make sure you're getting your ribeyes, you're getting your seafood, all sustainable seafood, all at farm to fork delivery.ca. I'm telling you, taste the farm to fork difference. And we're, we want you to taste the farm to fork, to fork difference. That's why listeners to this show, LOSP 10 gets you 10% off your first purchase. Taste the farm to fork difference, LOSP 10, 10% off. You will never go back to grocery store meats. Here we are, January 8th, talking about a team that has 14 wins in their first 35 games. Not enough wins, Ross. Not enough. I don't know how bad you could have convinced me this team would have been after 35 games, but I tell you, it wouldn't have been this bad. Wait, Ross, is it not enough wins or not enough over uh, overtime or shootout losses? Like, I was looking at the standings again today. The Ottawa Senators have more wins than the Columbus Blue Jackets. But the Blue Jackets have nine. That's the team you're that's the high hopes you're comparing this team to. Ross, we gotta we gotta look up at who's who's right above us, and that is the Columbus Blue Jackets. They got one more win than them in Ross, six less games, but they have seven less points. It's it's crazy how many of these overtime loser points are just being handed out. And I'm so jealous that the Ottawa Senators don't have any of them. Only team in the National Hockey League without a single loser point. Your losers. Ottawa Senators. Now, look, Steve Steos, very active. They're talking about it on 32 Thoughts. They're talking about it all over the place. Steve Steos, open for business, but still believes in this young core. And it would be kind of strange for him not to because... For how long they held on to DJ Smith, it's going to get better. It's going to be, get better. It does feel a little hasty to nine games later be like, oh, blow the whole thing up, right? Yeah, you yeah, need yeah. a little bit more time with Jacques Martin. But on the flip side of that, 
there is a belief. I think we discussed it when the hiring was made that Jacques Martin is probably going to be working for the team next year as a non coach. I, I think he'll be back in management. I think if he wants it, like Jacques Martin is right. going to do whatever he wants. He's 71 years old with an incredible resume. He's not going to do anything that he's not interested in doing. So with that said, He's probably giving some blunt truths about certain guys, maybe work habits, and I'm, I'm not going to speculate on who or what, but just they feel like they need a pro's pro. Do you think adding Joseph and adding Pinto is enough for now, or do you really think Steve Stales, because it can't be easy this time of year to make trades, right? Everyone's kind of seeing what they have. They want to kind of have the arms race closer to the trade deadline. Do you think that he could actually make a move here let's say before the all-star break at the start of february i don't know ross like the only move that would like really make sense to me and i'm not sure how you find the proper partner for this is using either tarasenko and or kubalik like guys you know are going to be done after this season and you want to move on from those contracts either he's got to ship them out for draft capital and then collectively use that draft capital to gain a roster player or have those two guys as part of some move where a roster player comes back. But teams in playoff hunts aren't going to want to take on too much salary. And sure, it's not like those are huge cap hits. Tarasenko, $5 million, Kubalik, half of that, 2.5. But still, I don't. I just think it's going to be hard to find a dance partner with trading a rental away for a solid veteran uh, bottom six guy. And I'm assuming Steve Stales would want them with term. Uh, so... I just, I don't know how you get that done. No, I, I don't either. I'll be very curious. We keep going back. He, there's been no outside additions made since the change in management. So we'll see what kind of players they target. If there's a player that you have in mind, let us know in the comments later on this week. If nothing else happens, we will discuss certain names that the Senators could target. And no, Phil Kessel is not coming to Ottawa. <laughs> I saw that in the comments the other day. I just do not see it happening. Although he does have that Leafs connection where the Senators love the former Leafs almost as much as Kyle Dubas. I was going to say, Kessel Senators. to Pittsburgh seems to make a lot of sense to me. I mean, Kessel to Pittsburgh, Kessel to Vancouver with the Rick Tockett situation. We thought that might have happened earlier. It obviously never developed. Uh, practice today, still waiting on lines, but I teased it off the top. One defenseman not taking part, and that is Artem Zub. Finally, this decor gets healthy-ish. And I don't know. Did you see the video where they were all saying hi to Nick Holden in, in Edmonton? The Sens no. posted it. They only posted it on Instagram. It was uh, it was in the locker room. There's some good content in it. But then you look and, and Thomas Shabbat's coming up to say hi. This guy is, is still fully limping. Like, I don't know if it was like right after Shabby? practice. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So go go take a peek at that on, on the Instagram. But, but hey, he's well enough to play. So uh, he'll be judged accordingly. But that said, Artem Zub now not on the ice for practice. Hopefully he's good to go uh, tomorrow. And we'd be remiss to mention that like Artem Zub took both those penalties that cost Ottawa two goals on the power play. The first one was a complete phantom call. Like the, the refs was wearing this McDavid jersey underneath his, his ref attire on that one. Yeah, because that's the one where McDavid was kind of tugging on his stick, wasn't he? He spun out of the corner as Zub was trying to pin him against the wall. He just spun out from it, grabbed his stick, said, see you later, throw that away, Yeah, and then off he went. Yeah, and then the other one was like a pick play that Zub did, which... Probably a penalty. De depending on how the refs view it, yeah, it, is, it could or couldn't be a penalty, but yeah. <laughs> so Zub's out, and we've got new... Pairs on the blue line. Thomas Shabbat with okay, Jacob Bernard yeah. Docker. We've seen that before, Pilsy. We've got yeah, Jake Chikrin with Jake Sanderson. And then Brandstrom gets the pleasure of playing with Travis Hamannick. Your thoughts on uh, if Zub is out tomorrow, uh, that that's how the Senators will line up. That's courtesy of TSN 1200. Uh, I'll get into that. I also just want to note off the top, Matthew Joseph on the top line with Kachuk and Norris. Um, no spoilers. <laughs> sorry that was just that jumped out at me right away uh shabbat jvd i still think can work out uh it hasn't worked out recently but i, I still believe it so i'm okay with giving that a little bit more time and it keeps shabbat on the left side i don't like moving sanderson to the right side with chikrin chikrin and shabbat didn't work as lefty lefty partners so i can't remember if chikrin and sanderson have played a lot together have they ross uh, not a whole so. lot. 
I can especially pull that with up. Sandy on the right side. I don't think so. Exactly, but I mean, I, I can pull this up though on MoneyPuck.com. So uh, yeah. if pull, if you'll go ahead, pull that up. I'll I'll keep uh, going through this, and then Branny. That's the thing. Like, I would love to have a left left side strong side of Shabbat, Chicker, and Sanderson. I don't know how you properly get them all the ice time that makes sense, but get Branny on on the right side uh, somehow here as well. Maybe Chicker and Branny, and then I guess it, but that leaves Sanderson with Hamnick. Like. I don't know. It's tough to put this. It's tough to put the pieces of this puzzle together in a way that works, Ross. Uh, unfortunately. Yes, and uh, Pilsy, maybe this is a Sean Tierney special because, according to Money Puck, uh, among Senators D pairs that have played at least eighty minutes together, Sanderson this season, this, San- this season yeah, okay. uh, Sanderson and Chicken have played eighty-four minutes together in uh, in spanning across twenty-seven games, sometimes just a couple seconds each. They have the highest expected goals for percentage, and it's not particularly close. When they're on the ice, the Senators have 64.7% of the expected goals on the ice. The next best pair, uh, funny enough, it's Eric Brandstrom with Jacob Bernard Docker, and that's at 52.6. Okay. Now, uh, do, you, do you have the Corsi 4 percentage there? I do not. Um, okay. I that's... can, though. Shot, shot attempts 4. Corsi four percentage. Sanderson Chikrin also leading there, sixty point five. The next best pair is Shabbat and Chikrin at fifty four point four. Okay, okay. So yeah, I'm I'm willing to give it a try. Just I think no Zub in the lineup. Like if we could get a to a world where Hamnick is out of the lineups and Zub is is in there, and I mean obviously we don't know what's going on with Zub. I'm assuming it's nothing serious. Um, I think you could make a proper decor that would make sense. Yes. And it is worth noting. Jake Sanderson is on the right side. I think that's actually a little noteworthy there. Now up front, Matthew Joseph, as you mentioned at right wing with Norris and Kachuk sends fans who want to think happy thoughts can think back to two years ago, right? When Matthew Joseph got here, that's where he played. And he played really well for those 11 yep. games with Brady and Josh. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you want to go through the lines and I'll kind of comment on each one or how do you want to do it? Give me some more thoughts on on the, on the what you think of um, of Matthew mm-hmm. Joseph and, and maybe how long you think it could take him to get up to speed. Because that's that's to me the curious thought. Because again, it's not uh, an, an ankle thing like it was for him a couple or from last year where it took him a long time to get up and running. Like, are you confident that he can get right back and, and playing maybe the level of hockey that he did before he left? What was his injury again? I forget. Oh, it was a, uh, I want to say it was a ha- Matthew Joseph. This is, uh, I'm, I'm curious. Alfie was trying to help out there and, and give us the answer, but I know that uh, I'm trying to pull it up right now. I don't want to guess right. Lower, lower body injury. They're calling it. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, I don't remember what it was. It feels like forever ago. Um, so yeah, the game against the stars, I can't really properly common on whether I think that's going to slow him down skating wise, which obviously, obviously Matthew Joseph's speed is a big part of his game and why he's successful. So I guess we're going to find out Ross. Uh, I think uh, it might take a little bit of time to get going here. So we'll keep an eye on that, but I like the idea of putting him up there, Ross, because I feel like that's a guy that before he got hurt, he, he could do no wrong. Like it's the Matthew Joseph redemption story from last season to this season is incredible. So I like rewarding him with an opportunity because it's not like any of the other guys that have been playing in his absence have kind of earned the right to hold that top spot. Couple other interesting notes from practice today. We'll get to on the other side. Plus we will get to our sense prospect segment risers, follow fallers and the Belleville senators have won six in a row. How? We'll discuss next. This is Locked On Senators, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. FanDuel is the official online sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network. And for a good reason, they're North America's number one sportsbook. Why would you go anywhere else? And right now, new customers in the U.S. can get $150 in bonus bets with any $5 winning money line bet. Math guy, 
that's 150 bucks off five bucks if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to do it. And I love the app. It's the best sports book app out there. Trust me. And I love it because you're not just limited to money line. It's not just who's going to win, who's going to lose. There's so many ways that you can get some green numbers in your account. I like taking a look at the spreads, puck line, reverse puck line, alternate spreads, player props. Brady shots is always a nice one to follow over unders. You hope for goals. Life's too short to bet the unders and so much more. Maybe try some parlays out at FanDuel as well. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get in on the action. FanDuel official partner of the NFL. All right, Ilzy. So we have lines, and I have done my little background research here. So we're pulling it up right now. Senators lines of practice today from Calgary, where they will take on a Flames team that just lost a pretty embarrassing fashion to the Chicago Blackhawks yesterday, a team that just had nothing in terms of star power, in terms of any player making over $3 million. This was a upset to behold. So they're going to be in a prickly mood, I would imagine, tomorrow night at uh, 8 p.m. Central for me. You get uh, one hour up. So 9 p.m. Eastern start tomorrow against the Calgary Flames. Of course, you can subscribe on Locked On Senators YouTube, and we will let you know all our thoughts following the game in the postcast. So the lines of practice, we have already discussed one, and of course, I do this on the fly. So I will bring it to you like this, Pelzi. I will bring so, it to you as such. Switch Casty and Chartier on the fourth, and you got it. You were close. Oh, really? Close. I had. Oh, my goodness. Well, hey, you know what? I bet you when Jacques Martin put together these line combos, he was probably looking to do the same because, as we <laughs> mentioned, uh, Mark Costellic not doing himself any favors with the coaching staff. He only had one shift in the third period, and Pilsy, um, his change ended up a <laughs> ended up putting an odd man rush the other way that ends up costing the game winning goal. So uh, yeah, not great. So these are the lines of practice. Josh Norris between Brady Kachuk and Matthew Joseph, Tim Stutzla between Claude Giroux, who's playing the left side with Drake Batherson. Ridley Gregg is with Dominic Kubelik and Vladimir Tarasenko. And then Mark Kostelik is with Parker Kelly and Zach McEwen. We've already discussed the defense. Uh, No sign of who's going to start in goal. Um, Tarasenko on the third line, Giroux left wing. Which one of those is more interesting to you? I like Klozeru on the left wing of that second line, Ross. Uh, I think it's about time they utilized him uh, in a different spot just for the sake of trying to help it uh, kind of shake out the rest of the lineup nicely. Unfortunately, though, Ross, I would like a switch. I'd like Tarasenko playing on that line. Giroux, Stutzla, Tarasenko, I think would be a line that would work really well. You've got... Uh, defensively responsible guy like Claude Giroux. You got Tim Stutzla, who apparently is hashtag a disher and only a disher this year. Uh, and then you get a, a finisher, a sniper in Tarasenko. And Batherson's playing fairly well recently, so I'd like to have him on that third line to try to give a little boost and spread the line out, out a little bit. So that's the one thing I don't love about this because I really have a hard time seeing a line that has Kubelik and Tarasenko together having any success because those guys are are pretty much straight shooters. Like Tarasenko has shown there's some B game. He can play a little physical. He can get in on the four check and he's got some playmaking abilities, but Kubelik is, he's just a trigger man out there. So I don't, I think it hinders Tarasenko's sniping ability, kind of handcuffing him with Kubelik. Would you have preferred Parker Kelly in that spot? I mean, it sucks to move Kelly down because he's been arguably the best player. Uh, last arguably, couple- no. He's the only senator that scored a goal in the last two games. He scored yeah, one in each. That's what I was going to get to. Yeah, because he's their only goal scorer in the last couple of games. So it sucks to kind of demote him. But then, I don't know, are you then finding a way to shift Kubelik down to the fourth line? And if you're trying to trade this guy, that's not exactly a great strategy either. So I don't know. That's why it's going to be interesting, Ross, when Pinto comes back here. Because Kubelik has to be a, a fourth liner. Like, you're not... Has- I think you got to let Kelly up in the lineup and well, I don't know how you do that once Pinto comes back. Cause I assume they're going to move Greg to the wing, but I guess we're getting ahead of ourselves here. 
So despite <laughs> only six wins in their last 20 games, the Senators being seven games below 500, there is still plenty of intrigue with Shane Pinto set to come back January 21st against the Philadelphia Flyers. Pilsy, the World Juniors are wrapped up, and you were impressed by Tomas Hamara. Yeah, uh, this is Tomas Hamara's third World Juniors, which is uh, crazy. It's going to be weird, Ross, next year in Ottawa. Hamara not at a World Juniors. It's been a while since uh, we've had that. But look, you got to give a lot of credit. Sure, he's at his third tournament, so you expect bigger things from him. But I would say he's improved over his last two big time. Uh, our guy, uh, Prague Senator, he's going to be happy that this time around, I'm not going to be harping on Tomas Shamara's turnovers as the highlights of his tournament because this guy played a key role for Team Czechia. He was playing over 20 minutes a night, even like he had 26.03 was his uh, time on ice versus Slovakia at the start of the tournament. And then in that final bronze medal game up against Finland, Czechia has a, a miraculous comeback. They went 8-5. Mara was a big part of that, a goal and two assists, including, I believe, getting the game winner with uh, the net pull there, shot from the point. So this guy really turned things around. I think it was a tough start for him in Kitchener. He realized he's get, he's getting squeezed out of the lineup, so he asked for a trade, which is a bold move to do as a junior. They move into Brantford. He plays with Jorian Donovan, and he starts having some success. And then now he's riding the high of a great World Junior Tournament. So I, I'm liking what I'm seeing from Thomas Shamara recently, Ross. It's yeah. uh, good to see the young defenseman start to kind of grow into his own. Really impressive. He's a guy that didn't even crack our top 10 when we did our Sense Prospects last year. He'd certainly be in there if we did it right now, wouldn't he? Sure. Yeah, I think he's he's sneaking in, depending on what kind of where we're drawing the line of prospects, but he's looking good. He wasn't even an honorable mention, Pilsy. Like, should I pull this up for the people who are who are curious about where we had certain guys? Because uh, I think it's yeah. actually pretty interesting to note when you're looking at uh we're now this is May 2023 that we did our last top 10. We're almost it's almost time to do that. Maybe all-star break. That's when we'll do our next updated like uh, yep. top 10 prospect. Uh, roundup for the Ottawa Senators. But when you look at what we had going last May for Ottawa, it was number one, Ridley Gregg, who obviously has graduated at this point. He's a guy who is uh, a certified NHLer right now. And uh, Igor was number two. Zach Stapchuk, who scored the game winner in the last building he played in, in junior. Because if you remember, uh, the, not that I expect anyone to, the Winnipeg Ice played their playoff games at Canada Life Center where the Manitoba Moose play as well. So he got the winner with a minute and eight seconds left there. We had Mad Sogard at number four, Tyler Clevin at five, JBD at six, Boucher at seven, Yarventi at eight, Marilinen at nine, and Lassie Thompson at 10. Our honorable mentions were Stephen Halliday, Oscar Pedersen, and Philip Nordberg. If you had to pick, because we don't want to get too caught up in, in, in the details of this, or we could go for another hour, who's one guy that would be rising on your list, and who's one guy who would fall? I think Stephen Halliday is uh, definitely going to be a guy that's rising, He and we're going to get to him. He's playing with great consistency, so I don't think he's an honorable mention anymore. Uh, Lassie Thompson, he's out of this list. I mean, he was 10th anyways. JBD, I would say, is graduated as well, so that opens up another spot here. Um Unfortunately, Ross, I Oscar Pedersen, it's it's kind of tough to label him as a riser. And uh, I think we can transition to him uh, smoothly from Mara as the other sense prospect that was a part, uh, a, at least a big part of the World Juniors here. But unfortunately for Oscar Pedersen, his ice time was very limited, like averaging about 11 uh, minutes of ice per game, even less than 10 in that final game up against the U.S. where they lost. And he hasn't been able to get anything really clicking in the SHL only one assist in 21 games there. So we're hoping that Oscar Pedersen can kind of keep things going as it's got to be mentioned that playing in the SHL at his age and getting any kind of ice time is, uh, is a good sign, but you'd like to see some production from him here. And he still just, just scores when he goes back to his own age group, right? They sent him down just before he, he went to the international stage. And, uh, you know, at, against his age group, he's got four goals in four games again. So in his last 28 games against his own age group, he has 27 goals. Like, yeah, 
it, it just it's not translating right now to the pro. I, I'm excited to hopefully see him in Belleville next year. The irony about him not getting a whole lot of ice time, which which was a fact in the World Juniors, is that he wore a letter. He was wearing an A. So uh, yeah. clearly, we we know that he's a leader. We've seen we've had him on the show three times, gotten to meet him uh, when we did our Dev Camp interviews. Great guy. I'm not worried about him long term, but uh, I, I think he needs to find a new situation, and I think Belleville would be a good landing spot for him. My riser on this list, and he was already at number five, but Tyler Clevin, man, uh, watching him live, this guy hits like a truck. And, I mean, we knew that. We've seen the highlights, the K-Train, choo-choo. But, my goodness, I was lucky enough that um, I got to actually see his, his old man, uh, Chris, and just a great family. And um, you know what? They, they really know that he, he, he's going to be an NHLer. It's just about the process and about once he gets up there to be up there for good. And when you talk about the Senators decor right now, and and that's that seems like an element that they're missing, I'm glad they haven't rushed him because to me, when he gets there, when he gets like physically mature enough, and it's crazy to say that for a guy who's, you know, big, <laughs> mean, yeah. physical, but his puck skills were what impressed me the most. And he's making ch- little chip plays to his partner. He's, he, he looks good. So, to me, Tyler Clevin would, would get a, a, a notch up, and I hate to say I love Igor, but uh, a little more consistency, and he's starting to do that. He just uh, got a, his point streak extended as well, I believe five if not six games, and just played his 200th AHL game. So that, it's almost like, is that a, a good thing or a bad thing? The more AHL games means you're not in the National Hockey League where obviously he wants to be, but if he can keep doing what he's doing right now, and the not only the points are there with Igor, but also he's starting to get the defensive responsibility back. I was talking to David Foote, the uh, communications broadcaster for the Belleville Sens, and he's saying that they were, they were talking to Igor uh, before Christmas, and he's like, he was dash 10 at this time. He just couldn't get really much going. And he said, I want to be a plus player in the second half. So kind of like Crooker last year. And mm-hmm. he did that. And since then, Igor's plus two here. And uh, he actually didn't have a point on Sunday. I thought they were going to give him an assist on the second goal, but uh, no dice on that one. So his point streak ends at five games. But if he can keep this consistency going, then um, I'm ex- I'm hoping that we can see Igor uh, take another step forward here. But we had him at number two, probably a little high um at, at last may but i mean he had just scored a goal and an assist in the nhl and uh you know we we love him obviously as a guy and uh hopefully he can take the next step there so um that's the prospect roundup let us know who's rising and falling in your eyes pilsy uh i can't my final thoughts and then i'll get yours Stephen halliday certified disher yeah, I was I was going to cut you off and go back to Halliday if we were wrapping up the prospects because we've got to talk about him. I mean, he had one hell of a weekend to start 2024. So this weekend they played two games up against, I believe it was Bowling Green. Yeah, Bowling Green State. He's got five points, five assists, four apples in his first game of the year. This guy, like the fact the the hashtag not a disher the irony of it just grows and grows this guy is the ultimate disher so we're glad to see how they having a good season and he's on pace ross to basically do what he did last year he's got 19 points in 20 games and last year in 40 games he had 41 points so he's pretty much right around that same pace so you like to see that consistency from Stephen halliday in his sophomore year in the ncaa i'm curious I, i'm assuming Maybe I'm being a little bit kind of presumptuous here, but that he's going to finish the year in Belleville after he's done uh, the NCAA year. I, I think he could be a great addition to this team, it's, too. It's possible, Ross. I mean, he's 21 years old, 6'3", 215 pounds. So it's not like that would be a guy that, you know, is is too early or, or not big enough to play in that uh, level of hockey. So it'd be fun. That'd be it'd be nice, Ross. To we need something to look forward to at the the latter part of this season. So having Halliday come in and play in Belleville, we'll we'll take what we can get. We like that. And Ridley Gregg being sent down at the end of the year, and him getting some games, and hopefully Tyler Boucher can continue. He's got a goal and an assist through his first seven games. But I mean, they're That's six and right. one. They're six and one in those games as well. Um, you look at Belleville defensively, though, only allowing seven goals in their last five games. Unreal. So they're battening yeah. down the hatchets there. Yeah, exactly. They, they've done a great job there. And uh, that's where you got to give uh, stick taps to the goaltending. And uh, we're a hashtag goalie friendly show. So give us the opportunity to give stick taps to the goalies. And that's what we're going to do. And I really think, Ross, like 
Matt Sogard, you got to give it to him. He's been playing really well. But I want to give a shout out to Kevin Mandelese here. Like this guy is just a trooper for Ottawa. He he's plays in the ECHL, AHL, NHL, wherever you need him. Mando's ready to accept the call. Listen to his save percentages the last uh, games he's played here, Ross. I'll go in chronological order. 962, 912, 935, 943, and then a 950 last game up against the Manitoba Moose. Like that, that was incredible numbers. And even without two of Belleville's top offensive guys, and Angus Crookshank leads the team in points, and Yuri Smekel, a guy who's really been heating up lately, this team was able to win games because the goaltending is keeping the minute and they don't need to score that many goals to get the dub. So overall, you love what you see from Belleville here. And uh, final stick taps goes to David Bell. He's doing a good job down there. He's doing a great job. Oh, look at this. Perfect timing. Perfect timing, Pilsy. Uh, power play uh, lines? Power play lines is your <laughs> okay, final thoughts. Now, go. people are going to be interested at this. People are going to be interested. We got what we wanted. But at what cost? <laughs> I knew this was coming. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. So Claude Giroux is on the top power play unit. Finally. You know, who? if you had to guess, who came off? Uh, so I'm I'm looking at it now. I couldn't wait for your tea, so I'm looking at it now. That would be dishonest of me to guess correctly. Tim Stutzla is going to be on the second unit. Now, I'm curious to see where he lines up. So that'll be some intrigue going into tomorrow's game. How are they going to line up these power play lines? Uh, one other thing is that Mark Kostelik is yeah. going to be on the second power play unit. Kind of ironic, a guy who you've been taking ice time away to give yep. it to him. But what they're looking at definitely is the Yuri Smekal position. Kubelik's just not cut out to be the net front guy. So no, if you're no, going to have a big body there, Cassie's the guy. This is an. This might be one of those things where they're telling Casty, like, "Hey, look, man, you're on the hot seat right now." Smekal went from net front on the power play to the minors, <laughs> so and maybe it's one of those, like, "Hey, this is your role now. Make the most of it, or it might be your last role for a little while." This is a huge, uh, what do you call it? Extending a branch leaf. Uh, Put up or shut up. Yeah, like it, this is huge for the coaching staff to say to Casty, "All right." You're, you're not playing the physicality game we want. You're not playing defensively how, how we want. And you're not even winning face-offs here. What we're going to get for you is you're getting an opportunity to be on that second power play unit. You're a big guy. Be a big guy in front. Screen, create chaos in that slot area. And open up space for our talented players. And I think I think Casty needs to take a good look at this and be like, this is a pivotal moment for me, not only in this season, but this if he doesn't have success here and gets sent back down, that could be a big game changer for him, big picture. So let's see it, Casty. He, he's got the body type for it. Let's see if he's got the willpower for it because they need help on the power play. And going to a fourth line center that you've been benching periodically, that reeks of desperation, Ross. And that's where this team is at. So I like it. You got it. You got to try something new. And Tim Slitzler. We know you're the top guy. You're you're the top earning guy on this team. You're leading the team in points, but hasn't been good enough. We can't keep trotting you out there on the first unit. So I actually like these moves, Ross, and uh, we'll see how it works out. It also gives you two righties on the top unit, which they'd been really needing. Mm -hmm. Like the four sure. four lefties on the top unit, you just cannot have that. And it's it's weird to say. I never really thought about handedness as that important, but you can tell because there's only one shooting option right now. But now you've got Batherson and Giroux on the top unit. Maybe that's another reason they wanted at least one righty on the second unit. And maybe that's why Ridley Gregg's not on there. Casty's a righty, so at least you have that, even though. It, you, you can put him with a straight blade the way he's going to be playing right in front of the net. Uh, it doesn't matter doesn't as much. Stick. Yeah. I'm also curious to see which side of the ice Tim Stutzel's on. Cause I'd like him with his head up on his weak side being maybe even a shooting option. Call me crazy. Maybe have him as a bit of a shooting option. Probably not though. Cause that's where Tarasenko likes to be. The yeah. second unit still has Tarasenko Sanderson and Chikrin and the first unit Kachuk Norris, Batherson, Giroux and Shabbat. Plenty, plenty to chew on here, Pilsy. And we'll discuss more tomorrow on Locked on Senators. For more, you can head over to YouTube. Check out the argument we made. Why Claude Giroux needs to be on the top power play unit. And we got our wish. Maybe Alfie, maybe Jacques Martin were listening to yesterday's episode. That's what I'll believe, at least for now. You've been listening to today's episode. But for more, you can always catch us wherever you get your podcast. We'll chat with you tomorrow on a game day against the Calgary Flames. 
And maybe later this week, we'll check in more with the Belleville Sands. For today, we say goodbye. For Brandon Piller, I'm Ross Levitan. This has been the Locked On Senators Podcast, your team every day.